scripture reading today is in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquent or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I come to you in weakness and fear, and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith may not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Good to be here this morning. I'm going to have to go keep it going back and forth this way. Um, well, everything that, everything I've heard of this morning is just set up with what I have to speak about. I texted my wife this morning. Thanks for the last song that you did. I texted my wife this morning. I took a little picture of the church and said I was ready to, to come in and preach Jesus. And I uh, and she knows this. I put it on there. Says I live. I live to preach Jesus. I do. I mean, I'm just, that's who I am. And, you know, I, I guess Pastor Allen's kind of warned you about me a little bit. I, I, sometimes I, I fling a little bit and get a little excited. And I, my wife even says this, sometimes talk too fast, so I will try to hold it down and not talk too fast this morning and, and, and stay, stay with, with, with you, and you can, so you can stay with me. Um, I love this scripture that you read this morning because that was Paul. You know, he, he, didn't, he didn't have big persuasive words. He didn't want anybody to take him for his articulation and how wise and how, wisdom, how full of wisdom he was. Just the last part of that, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And, you know, that's, that's, my, that's my whole heart is when I, I don't have anything to bring to you personally from me. I don't have that. I don't have that in myself, but I guarantee that the message that God gives me is power-driven because there's a life that lives in me. You know, I left another song that we sang this morning. I wrote it down. When Jesus come to live in my heart and when Jesus come to live in your heart, and we're going to find out what happens really, what that's all about when he comes to live in our heart. Um, just a real quick thing. I, I, I am in a, I'm a pastor slash evangelist. I started the church a few years ago, and I planted another church because we got to minister to a bunch of young people, and, and we kind of outgrew that church, and so we, we went to a bigger church, and, and uh, the Roxy Theater in Lewiston, Idaho came open and to buy, and I've always had a heart for a, a vision for downtown right in the middle of Roxy, downtown in the middle of Lewiston, so I, I bought the theater and stepped down from the pastor at as, as, as this church. 
and becoming what I've always been really for 25 years as an evangelist. <laughs> because I, 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 what Paul says, I, I want to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, there's lots of good preaching. There's lots of good teaching. We need all of it. So we all have our areas, but God's put me in a specific place for the last few years especially, is I want to preach him and the message of this cross because I really believe, i got to be careful because I get going a whole different direction, that sometimes the church can get so far away from preaching good stuff and, and, get, and there's rabbit trails of theology and doctrine and all this eschatology and everything. Pretty soon we've strayed a long ways from the cross. And God's just, and that's not wrong. I'm just saying what God has put in my heart is to preach Jesus and Him crucified to keep us closer to the cross. And never forget the only reason we're sitting here assembled today in this church as the church is because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. That's why we're here. And sometimes we can lose track of that doing good things for, I'm slinging my hands already, okay, <laughs> we, so doing things for the Lord that we lose the message of the cross. He, he, he wants you and I to always remember that he came to save us, to put us into a relationship with the Father. That's his main goal and purpose. And, and then sometimes we can get so caught up doing things for him that we lose that personal connection in that personal relationship with him. And he planned for all that. He planned for all that because he had that plan from the get-go. And the, the great gospel is he would come, live a perfect life, that he would be crucified, that he would be buried, that he would rise from the dead. He would ascend to be seated at the right hand of the Father. And from there, send back the helper, the comforter, the teacher, the, the guider, the convictor to come back and live in you and I, the Holy Spirit to come back and live in you and I. And that's what I've entitled this message today is when Jesus is in the house. When Jesus is in the house. Now, it started out, well, I'm going to go back just a little bit. I started to tell you, I bought the Roxy Theater, so I'm evangelizing out of the Roxy Theater. Um, I, I love what I'm doing. Um, so I'm dependent totally on God down there. Uh, we're ministering to people that come by on the streets. I'm doing a recovery program. The Lord delivered me from alcoholism 37, almost 38 years ago now. And so I, my heart's to reach the lost, truly reach the lost and the ones that are hurting. And downtown Lewis is a good place because there's a lot of people walk up and down that street that are lost and hopeless. And because we know too that there's a lot of people in every town living up on big hills making big money that are lost and hopeless. But my heart's to reach those, those, those people that are down there. So that's kind of what I'm doing. I, I, we have an outreach on Sunday night. I do the recovery group on Thursday night. I try to do some things on, on Friday night. We're trying to do some movies and, and Christian uh, karaoke night stuff just to kind of bring a little income into the building and stuff. So I'm excited about what I'm doing. But basically what I do down there, I, I told someone here this morning that the address in, at the Roxy Theater is 714 Main in Lewiston. So I put on the wall in big letters, I had this guy make them up for me, Second Chronicles 714. If my people who were called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their ways, and, and I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. So that's what I put on the wall. And that's what that, my vision for the Roxy Theater is to be a place of worship, a place of prayer. Uh, on, the, on the other side, I put, which I'll get into a little bit here, Luke 4, 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to open the eyes of the blind, and set at liberty those who are oppressed. That's my vision and my goal for the Roxy. I have no other vision or goal for the Roxy but to preach Jesus. People have asked me, this. well, Nick, let's make a soup kitchen out of it. Let's do this. Let's do that. There's a Salvation Army. I preach at The Rock, which helps the homeless in, in Lewiston. I, I preach there. And I told him, I do not want the Roxy Theater where I'm at, the Roxy, 714 Main, where I'm at. I don't want it to be known as a place you can come in and get anything but Jesus. <laughs> I just don't. That's all. That's why I'm staying there. I mean, I, I, I believe in all this other help. But right now, you, you, can, you can start all these other programs and get things for people to come in. And pretty soon they're coming in for everything but Jesus. I have one thing to offer at the Roxy. One thing, Jesus. If that's not enough, well, they just have to find somewhere else. That's who I am. And that's what I have to offer. So that's kind of where, I, where I'm at there. And, and, I, and I love what I'm doing. And, and I intend to do it until God takes me home. <laughs> we'll see what happens. We just do it one day at a time. But anyway, this, this message that Jesus is in the house. He come to live in my heart. He come to live in your heart. And I, I, um, I've read this story. And if you want to turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 2 to get set up here. 
I've read this story many times. I've preached on this story. It's where the four men would come down to, and they, they come to bring this paralytic to Jesus, but they couldn't get there because it was packed. They couldn't get in the house. They, there's no way they could. So they busted the roof out and they let him down through the roof to Jesus so he could get him to Jesus. You know, I preached on this message of the faith that these guys had to do this, the risk that they took, the love that they had. I preached on the fact that Jesus said, your sins are forgiven versus, you know, well, take up your bed and rise, proving that he was God. So I've preached on several different aspects in this story. But one day a while back, I was reading it again, and I just bang. You know, that, the word of God is living. You see, that's when this, when this Jesus comes into the house, and we understand that it's living, and we can read and reread the word, and all of a sudden we read it again, and boom, there's something new that comes out at us. It's, the word hasn't changed, but see, we change as we grow, and, the, and it becomes new to us. Wow, I didn't see that before. And that's what happened when I read this the last time. Something else jumped off the page at me. So let, before I go into the story, we, we know the story. Let's read the story, and then I will explain to you what happened. In Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house, that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together, so there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing, the, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus saw their faith. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Sons, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And immediately he rose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that they were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this before. We never saw anything like this. That was the funny thing right there because he's telling them that he was God. I, I'm not going to preach in the whole message because there's so many things to be preached out of this. But the thing that jumped off my page when I read this the last time was he was in the house. <laughs> Jesus was in the house. And it makes me sad because of my heart and connection with the Lord to see, the, I might, I'm not saying here, but everywhere, we, everywhere we go, churches should be packed, crammed. They should, there should be, and, and, and it should be Jesus that bring people in the house. There's too much of, well, if you got donuts and lattes and cookies and entertainment and all this stuff, Jesus is in the house. That should be enough. He was in the house here and there were so many people, they couldn't even get in the house. And it talks about that when he goes into his ministry. He healed the, 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 the person, the, the man with the demons. He healed the lepers. He was healing everybody. And they were going out and telling everybody, Jesus had a reputation. And everywhere he went, Jesus, they wanted to be where Jesus was. I just pray to God that the church could get there today where, we would, where we'd want to be with Jesus <laughs> and, not, and be with him alone. So, that jumped off the page. Jesus was in the house. And I thought, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. That's when I started getting the Holy Spirit revelation was do you realize how many people go to church? This is a nice building. I've been to a lot of big buildings. There's lots of new churches in Lewiston, the big cross point. It's huge, it's a beautiful building. But do you realize that each and every one of us are the church? We are the church. This is a building. When we all leave this building, this will be a building. Right now, it's church because we're here. We're assembling together. And because we're here, because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this solid and clear. Because we are here, Jesus is in the house. <laughs> 
because he lives in you and I. And that's the thing the Holy Spirit spoke to me so strongly. He said, you know how many people go to church today and they sit, they come in and they sing a couple songs, they put the money in the collection plate and they leave and they miss Jesus. They don't even realize that his presence is there through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in you and I. And it's, 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 it's a sad thing because we're, we're, we're being robbed by the enemy if we don't understand that we have the greatest gift in the world we have the greatest gift is Christ lives in you and I and when so therefore when we come like this and assemble Jesus is in the house I'm going to say something here I used to really get me when I first become a Christian the pastor would say look at your neighbor and say Jesus is in the house Look at your neighbor and tell him, Jesus is in the house. I used to hate that when my, when my pastor would do that. But he is. Jesus is here right now. He's, he's here. Now, a lot of you, I know you, you're probably up to date on your, on your theology and your doctrine, and you know, well, now, Pastor Nick, that's not totally true. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, and you'd be right. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. That's where he is. But through his great plan, see, he knew. He knew when he left, we'd be hopeless, helpless without him. So he said, I'll, pro I'll send back the Spirit. I'll send back the Comforter to live in you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 says, We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He will be the one that comes back and lives in you in us. Therefore, we can say Jesus is in the house. In John chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus himself would say this, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. He will be in you. Okay, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. I mean, that's a promise from Jesus that he would come down. And, and, and there's, there's so many Christians not, not saved. We're saved. They're saved, but they don't realize that they have the presence. They have the life of God living inside them. It's not a salvation issue. When you put your faith in Jesus, he puts his spirit in you and you're saved. But it is an issue of the joy of your salvation, the peace of your salvation, the witness of your salvation. When we start getting this spark and realize there's a life that lives in me that's going to take me out and give me an overcoming life, it changes things in our life when we realize that he's in the house. What the, what the Holy Spirit does, see, he takes religion and turns it into relationship. He does. There is, I can't tell you how many kinds of religion, there are thousands of ways. Listen to Oprah. There's 10,000 ways to Jesus or, or to God, to heaven. No, there isn't. There's one way. It's through Jesus Christ, and he himself said it. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so it's the Holy Spirit, see, that makes it relationship. He is the one that takes religion and makes it into relationship. When he come into my life, I can testify of this and I you guys can testify your own I know when the Holy Spirit come into my life he made Jesus real he made everything I was reading in this Bible real because he will always teach me he will always guide me he will always teach you he will always guide you he will always point you to Jesus he will always point you to Jesus and that's how we know he is the guarantee he is the down payment that everything in this book is true because his life lives in you and I and when we and therefore again I might say it a few times so we can just get the let the Holy Spirit speak this let me just pray. Lord, I just pray right now. Holy Spirit, would you just minister to us today? Father, that you would, through the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, that you promised to send back, that you would ignite us, that you would make us really understand. Lord, that you would take the head knowledge. I had that head knowledge for two or three years before I got the heart knowledge when the Holy Spirit really came and took all this information in the Bible and transformed it into my heart, into transformation. Holy Spirit, would you take, the, would you take it out of our minds and put it into our hearts, that you live, you dwell with purpose in our hearts to lead us, to guide us, to direct us, to comfort us, but to more than anything, to put the focus and spotlight on Jesus. Lord Holy Spirit, you make this Bible real. 
Jesus said, the words I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Holy Spirit, would you speak life to us this morning in Jesus' name, amen. So as I was saying, that's the Holy Spirit that takes religion and makes it relationship. Thank God for relationship. That's what I want. I want more than anything, relationship with Jesus. And he always makes that happen. So as we look at this story right here, I'm going to go through some, through some things here this morning that happens when Jesus is in the house. Now, obviously, in this story, what happened? Someone was healed. <laughs> Someone was healed. When Jesus is in the house, there's healing. And we, we've read the story where he said, well, you, they, was, I won't preach the message there because the Pharisees and the scribes, well, what, what do you mean? You're, you're forgiving his sins. You, 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 only God can do that. Well, if, well I mean, let me show you who I am. Then take up your bed and walk. So he's just telling these guys, hey, I am God. That's what he's telling them. But he did. The man stood up, he rose, and he was healed of his affliction. And he walked away carrying his bed. So God, when Jesus is in the house, there's healing. He, was, he bore stripes for us, for our personal healing, specifically our eternal healing. And that's what we really need to understand sometimes. You and I are going to go through physical problems. We're going to have health problems. God will heal some of them, some of them he won't. But we need to understand, in Peter it says, by his stripes we are healed. That, and if you look at that, that word stripes are a singular in the Greek to mean by that last stripe, by his death, you and I are eternally healed. You and I have salvation. You and I have our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We're going to live forever. The Word of God says in the book of Hebrews that it's appointed for man to die once. We will all have one physical death. But we won't have that second death when we know Jesus Christ, where we'll be thrown into the lake of fire. We'll, we'll die one time. And that's what, that's what we need to understand when, when that happens, when the Holy Spirit comes into us. So, so, we, so we're permanently, spiritually, eternally healed the moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ. We are. In spite of all the things and difficulties and health problems we will go through in our life, we have eternal security. I could go on in the book of James. <laughs> it says, our life's but a vapor. I can see some of you are about, by, about my age. We're, I'm, I'm seeing that. Maybe Jacob don't see that quite as, quite as good as I do right now. But I'm seeing it. <laughs> he will one day. And I'm sure he does as a Christian. The Holy Spirit admits that. It is. It's, it's snap in. Where, where did the last 30 years go? I have no idea, but they're gone. <laughs> so anyway, we're, we're eternally healed. We've got to remember that. But he's still in the business of physically healing. I have a testimony. I bought the Roxy Theater. I work 12 hours a day fixing this place up. I put a lot of time, money, and effort into this place. And I literally wore my left arm out. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't pick up a cup of coffee with my arm. I couldn't squeeze and hold it. I hurt so bad. There's a name for it. Went to the doctor, and they put a big bandage on it. And we were praying one night in the war room upstairs, and this lady who was a nurse, she just, as a matter of fact, said, Oh, I see you got, she named the thing, let me pray for you. And she just reached over. I didn't even have time to say, well, okay. And then she just reached over, put her hand on my arm, and started praying. And my arm got so hot, it just went right down out my fingertips. And I went like this. I thought, oh, my gosh. <laughs> and I'm a little excitable. You think I'm excitable? You should have saw me that night. Because I got up and I started picking up chairs. I said, oh my goodness, it's gone. It, I, can, I, I couldn't even pick up a cup of coffee. And I'm picking up chairs. I'm running around in the prayer room. I, it, I was healed immediately. I was healed. And it's not come back. It's not come back. So he does. He still heals. He's still in the process of healing when, when he desires. And, and I think, I don't think, I really believe a lot of the healing that happens to us, and when things happen to us, we say, wow, what just happened? Is I call them, what I had that night, it was a miracle, it was a healing, but I call it a candid camera moment. Now, you guys remember watching candid, everybody here watch candid camera? When you least expect it, you're elected. It's your lucky day. You know, it's how so God's grace works. That's how healing works sometimes. When we least expect it, man, God shows up and he heals us. And that's what he did that. And I had a candid camera moment with the Lord himself because he healed my arm. So when Jesus is in the house, there's healing. Amen? Okay, let's go on and let's look at something else. When Jesus is in the house, there's liberty. Love this one. There's liberty. And I looked up the definition of liberty. And it's deliverance from the control, captivity, or confinement. 
Anybody been here? Any, anybody had something that controlled your life, put you in captivity, put you in confinement, didn't like where you were at? Well, that's what it is. And that's what liberty is. It's being released from that. It's being delivered from that. Don't have time to go into the story, but when Jesus cast the demons out of the legion, he, he, this guy, he was confined. He was, he was in captivity. He was totally controlled by demons. And Jesus come and he cast them out. I love the story. I, love, I heard a pastor preach one time because they, they just said, well, don't send us out of the land. So Jesus, remember, he put him in the 2,000 head of swine and the pigs, and they all went into the sea and perished. Well, I heard a preacher, pass, preacher one time on that, and he says, boy, you put, you put uh, that, uh, uh, cast the demons out of there and put them in all these swine. He said, that'd be a lot of deviled ham. <laughs> so, but where the Spirit of the Lord is, when Jesus is in the house, there's liberty. Now listen to the scriptures. If you want to write it down, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. It's not by power, not by might, but by the spirit of the Lord. Then when he's there and he shows up and we give into that, to, into that power, there's liberty. He will set us free. I can't tell you how many people I've worked with that, that are bound and determined to set themselves free from whatever they're going through. And they, I tell them, you can't do that. Just give in, obey, let the Spirit come in, let Him do this, and He will take these issues out of your life. It's not by power, not by might, but by the Spirit of the Lord. I love the Scripture. I said I would read it. Uh, Luke 4.18, that's where Jesus come on the scene. It's my passion and it's my heart, this scripture right here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And, and so we have been delivered. It's set at liberty. That's Jesus when He came on the scene was to do that. And I fell into all those categories. I was poor. I was brokenhearted. I was blind. All of them. And Jesus set me free from that confinement, from that control. Because when Jesus is in the house, there's liberty. Amen? We sang a song today that had hope in it. I was going to write that down. Because all these songs, as I'm singing these songs, I think, well, that fits right in. That fits right in. When, Je when Jesus is in the house, there's hope. Has anybody looked around at the world lately? Whew. Boy, I'll tell you what. Without the Lord... You can look around, you can say, there, there, there's a lost, hopeless world out there. There really is. There's a lot of people needing hope. And I truly believe that there's a lot of people who aren't Christians that are scared to death. And one of these days, we need to be ready as a church when they start coming in for answers because it's hopeless out there. But when we have Christ, we have hope. We have a security. And I'm not talking about, well, I'm going to put $10 in the lottery and hope I win $100 million. Not that kind of hope. Or maybe getting up this morning and seeing, well, I sure hope it don't snow today. Don't know. That's not the kind of hope I'm talking about. I'm talking about the kind of hope we know that we have. In 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, we've been begotten again to a living hope. How do we know we have a living hope? Because the living hope is in the house. <laughs> he is the one that gives us the hope. We, see, we serve a God that's alive. We serve a God that's not dead. He rose from the dead, and because of that, we have a living hope. And you know, sometimes we need to get that lemon look off our face, that sourpuss look off our face, and have a little joy that we have a living hope living inside of us. Amen? And it's the Holy Spirit. He, not it, the, the thing. He lives in us. Now, what does he do? And, and now listen to this. In Ephesians chapter, I should have had some of these, but I, I'm the kind I, I like to, you write them down. And you know what I used to do? 
When I was first going to church, the pastor would preach, and I would write down his scriptures, and I would go home, and if it was in Ephesians 1-3, I would read the whole book of Ephesians. <laughs> I would. If it was in Galatians, I'd read the whole book of Ephes or Galatians. I mean, that's how I was. So I'm encouraging you, write these down and just go read these scriptures. But this is how we know we have a living hope. Right here it says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory the holy spirit is our guarantee he is the one that's come in he's the down payment in our life remember the old s and h green stamps where you could go redeem your s and h green stamps he's our redeemer the holy spirit is our redeemer he's our he's our guy he's our counselor he's the one that guarantees us that we have this living hope there's one more scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. It says, Now he who has prepared for us this very thing is God, who has also given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So as we go through the trials and tribulations that Jesus promised, we would have a living hope that goes with us. Everywhere we go, Jesus is in the house. I want you to put that in your mind. It's not... It's not just a little cliche, it's true. Jesus is in the house. When you start speaking that in your life, that Jesus lives in my house, man, there's liberty there. There's some peace there. There's some hope there. But when Jesus is in the house now, what else is there? There's love. <laughs> there's love. I started His Banner Church 10, 11 years ago. And the God gave me, I mean, went up River Pass, and he gave me the, the name of the, the, the church, His Banner Spirit-Filled Church, out of second, or, um, Romans 5.5. 5. It says, He pours out His love into our hearts through the power of His Holy Spirit. So my church was His Banner Spirit-Filled Church because of the love all through my life. But when I was delivered from alcohol, when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the love that God poured into my heart was so tremendous. I mean, it was so tremendous. So I... I, I I, got it. I, I could go on, but I needed love. Anybody here need love in your life? <laughs> Just really to truly be, know you're loved by somebody. My dad wasn't very loving, and I won't go into all that, but he wasn't. But I needed so much to know I was loving. When the Holy Spirit came to live in me and poured his love into my heart, it changed me forever. Maybe I'll share that at the end if I get time. I don't know. I can see a clock. I know I, I got to be... What's a clock mean to a pastor anyway? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> well, I don't want you to miss Sunday school. But listen to this. Just some things I wrote down. God is loved. He loved us before we loved him. Nothing can separate us from his love. We are to love one another. Perfect love casts out fear. We're not given the power, the spirit of fear, but one of the power of love and a sound mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. For God so loved the world. Love, 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 love. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And I'm not talking a cheap love where we can say, well, I got the love of God. I'll go live like I want. I'm not talking about that kind of love. But that's the kind of love, an unconditional love. I don't know about you. But I was searching for that. And, and, and so don't think in your mind right here. I get going sometimes, little thoughts come to my mind. Don't think that you can earn this love because it's unconditional. You can't add a bunch of dues to what Jesus Christ has already done. It's been done, so don't try to add and do things for it. Just receive the love that he's given to you. See, when you do that, then you're going to want to line up with his word. You're going to want. That's a great, this is the greatest love letter ever written is the Bible written to you and I. And too many people see it as, well, all these do's and don'ts and all this stuff. When we start seeing this book as a love letter, it'll change our our life and we won't it won't be do's and don'ts it'll say what can I do we'll want to do something when we see it as a true love letter that it is that's just a side note for there but <laughs> it's love and I'll tell you what when Jesus Christ come into my heart when he poured his love into my heart you ever, you ever get a flu shot it gives you, you get a flu shot it gives you just enough of the flu to keep you from getting the whole thing you know, I get a flu shot and I'll get a little fever and a little temperature and stuff and it'll go away. Then I don't have to worry about getting the whole flu. Well, see, that's what's the problem with a lot of Christians. They get a little inoculation, just enough of Jesus' love, just to be my Savior. And we'll talk about that a little bit maybe too. But just to be my Savior and they miss the whole thing. They don't get the rest because they got just a little bit. When Jesus came into my life, he gave me a lethal injection, man. He put the whole thing in there. I mean, it just, whoo! 
Woo! It changed my life forever. And that's what I tried to do. I tried to go around and, and give people a little, bit, a little bit more of an injection of Jesus' love because that's what we need. We need the whole thing. We don't need just enough to keep us from getting the whole thing. We need the whole thing. And he did. He, 25 years ago when he came into my life, he roared into my life. And he filled me with so much love. And it just keeps coming out. I mean, I may all get over it someday. It's only been 25 years. But it's, it's that way. He, we need, so desperately need, the love of Christ in our life. And I, I hope I can flood a little bit and just flood you with a little bit and you can just feel the Holy Spirit pouring that love into your heart. See, He wants you to receive all of it. So when He's in the house and He's in your house, He lives in you, there's love. Amen? Amen. Now, I said a little bit of this earlier. When Jesus is in the house, there's relationship. He is the one that takes religion, as I said, and turns everything into relationship. I'm going to probably not go real deep into this, but you can read chapter 17 in John. It's where Jesus prayed the great prayer that we would be one with him, we would be in him and him in us. That is the total reason that Jesus died on a cross for you and I. Everything else will come and go. He died to give you and I a personal relationship with the Father. It said when he breathed his last breath, the veil was torn from the top to the bottom, where now you and I could go right into the very presence of God himself, into the throne room of God, into the presence of the Father, into direct relationship. And there's a lot of things that will happen in our life as we work this out, this is our salvation out, fear and trembling. But don't ever forget, first and foremost, he wants wants that personal relationship he died he come to live in you to give you personal relationships see it's the holy spirit that takes you and i it says he's the one that'll put glory he kind of puts his spotlight on jesus all the time that's what the holy spirit does well see it how it works it just i'm just i'm going now he puts the light on jesus and we get excited. I do. I get excited when I start talking about Jesus because the Holy Spirit inside me, yeah, I'm doing my job now. I'm getting, fi I'm getting fired up. So he puts the light on Jesus. What does Jesus do? What did he say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So the Holy Spirit ignites in you. He puts the light on Jesus. Then Jesus takes you to the Father because he's the only way to the Father. And all of a sudden, we're all together as one unit. It's amazing when we can come together and have the relationship he wanted us to have. I mean, I love it. Wish I, do I live there all the time? No, I got. I, I do my, my wife is here, I'd say, ask my wife. I, I got my little problems and things going on too. But I love it when I understand when the Holy Spirit starts getting fired up and brings me to Jesus, Jesus brings me to the Father, and I'm where with one, and we're just, whew, we're together. That's why he died. That is why he died. Put a period right there. That's why he died. So you and I would have this relationship with him. Whew. Okay. When Jesus is in the house, there's power. And this is one really that breaks the heart of God. It really does. And I've spent, I don't know how many hundreds of hours of prayer about this in the church. The power to overcome. The power really to be witnesses for him. Now we go back to the book of Acts. In chapter 1, verse 8, we know the whole story. It says, when Jesus, when he left, he says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Power, 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 wonder-working power. That's what we get, to be witnesses for Jesus. And you know what? A lot of people don't because maybe they understand what that means. You know what that means? To be witnesses for Jesus? To be a martyr. <laughs> to go out and give your life up for Jesus. That's what, that's what he was telling them. And the disciples did that, didn't they? I wish the church, we could get back there closer to what they did. Giving up their life for him. Now, you look at this power. This is so real. When you look at and study this out, when you, you look and I'll just tell you briefly, you know Peter... Good old put my foot in my mouth, Peter. I love Peter. I mean, he gets knocked a lot of times. You know, he went out of the boat and went down in the water. Well, he, at least he got out of the boat. <laughs> and, you know, I could go on that subject too, but I won't go there. <laughs> but, I mean, there's power. Look at Peter. He denied Jesus three times. Three times he denied him. With cursing, he denied him. They were waiting up for him. He was afraid. They were all scared. They all scattered. There was no power there. But he said, you guys wait. You tarry. And I'll come back and I'll give you some power. 
What happened on the day of Pentecost? This little feeble guy that denied Jesus three times, he stands up and it said boldly, boldly spoke to the people. And for what it's worth, what he preached that day was the gospel. He said, this Jesus that you killed, God raised him from the dead. There's the gospel right there. And he said that a couple times under the power of the Holy Spirit now. He said it boldly. He wasn't afraid anymore. He said it boldly. And it said it cut the people to the heart. I want you to know what cut the people to the heart. It was the gospel <laughs> that they had killed Jesus. And technically, so did you and I. Our sin was there too. He died for your sin and my too. And it said it cut into the heart. And he said, what should we do? And he said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the repentance of sin. That's what happened. It was the gospel that was preached. And I want to stay today with the gospel, preaching the gospel, because that hopefully would bring conviction to people realizing, yeah, I'm that one. That cuts me to the heart. What can I do? Well, you, you stand up like Isaiah and say, here am I. Send me. And we'd be ready to to do something for Jesus. So when he comes in our house, there is power to witness for him and power. This is what breaks the heart of the Lord is because there's an enemy out there like a, like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now here again, it's not a salvation issue. It's a joy of your salvation. It's a witness of your salvation that we, that we get caught up in. It's not a salvation issue because the, we know that Satan, and I, I can show you lots of scripture of anything that ain't. He's the ruler of this world. Right now, Satan's ruling this world. But he doesn't have authority over you and I. We have power over him. 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater is he, who is he? The Holy Spirit, God, that lives in me than he that lives in the world. You and I have power over this toothless liar. And that's the only power he has. He lies to people just like he did in the garden. He will lie and deceive you as much as he can. But he can't do that if we realize that we have a greater power that lives in the house. I have a powerhouse. <laughs> he lives in this house. And we need to grasp that and start getting a hold of that. So all these things we have, we have, we have power, rape, healing, liberty, hope, love, relationship. All these things come when Jesus is in the house. If that's the case, then why are people living in a lot of church living this life of defeat instead of a life of victory? I'll tell you why. Because they're not giving Jesus the whole house. <laughs> and this is where it gets interesting. Did you ever have anybody come over for company and say, come on in, sit down, make yourself to home? You ever say that? Make yourself to home. Now, when you tell somebody to make themselves to home, are you saying, go check out the bedroom, check out, lay on the bed for a while, you know, go into the master bedroom, go into the bathroom, you know, check out the medicine cabinet. Just make yourself to home. You have just free rule of my house. <laughs> No, you usually say, sit down right there and I'll get you something to coffee or something. Don't move from there, but make yourself to home. That's your home right there in the living room. Well, do you know how many Christians ask Jesus Christ into their house? Come into my life, Jesus. Make yourself to home. Here, I got a special room right here. It's called the salvation room. Don't leave that room because there's some rooms I'm not sure I want you to see. You can stay in the salvation room and you know that's just taking him in as our savior. That's taking him in as fire insurance. I don't want you as my Lord really because I got some things over here in some rooms I don't really want you to see. There's some things going on. So just make yourself to home but I, I'm more comfortable you just stay right there in your little salvation room. That's why I say it's not a salvation issue because I want you to know that when you put your faith in Jesus, you are saved. And the enemy will try to lie to you when you have these other rooms and you have this stuff that you're hide, trying to hide from God. You can't hide it from God. But then the enemy will try to make you think, well, you've lost your salvation. No. There again, you're, he wants you to have love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, long-suffering, self-control. He wants to give you all these gifts. He wants to give you all the, 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 of, the, of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But we, don't, we miss that when we just leave him in one room. <laughs> he wants the house. I didn't say Jesus is in the room, did I? I said Jesus is in the house. Okay, let's look at one room that you and I all have. I won't even say do you. I'll just say we all have, and that's the dark room. We have a dark room. Now, we can have a lot of things going on in that dark room. 
Now, I've become out of alcoholism and pornography and all kinds of garbage. And you can say, well, I never had, I never had a drink. Before. I never had that porn. I never had this. But what about fear? What about anger? What about bitterness? What about judgment and criticism? So many things that, well, you know what happens in a dark room? If, you t- if you're a photographer, see, there's too many Christian photographers. We take all these pictures and we take them into the dark room. What do we do in a dark room? We develop the negatives. That's what we do in the dark room. If you're a photographer and you take pictures, you take your negatives and you're real careful to get them into a dark room, what happens if you expose that film to light? It ruins them. It destroys the negative. So what we do is we take these negatives into our dark room to develop them. What God wants to do is put light on that negative to destroy the negative. He wants us to quit developing the negative. Get it out of the dark room, let the light come on it, and destroy it. And that's what it'll do. Now we can say, well, this dark room, <laughs> he, Jesus, he can't get in there. He don't, he don't know what, yes, he does. He knows what's going on in our dark room. It says, light and dark are the same to him. In Psalm 139, where can I go to flee from your presence? If I go into the pits of hell, you're there. If I go up into heaven, you're there. No matter where you go, you can't hide from Jesus. You might have a dark room you don't think he knows about. He certainly does. But he will not get me. He will not barge into your dark room. He won't do it. He waits for you and I to just, I think, one basic word, help. God, would you shed some light on this? It breaks my heart because I've ministered to so many people that have these issues, especially men with pornography. They say, well, I'm so ashamed. You know what the shame is? Is that they won't share it. Because see, when we let the light come onto that negative and destroy the negative, the enemy's done. He wants us to live in the dark room. That's where he dwells. But he can't, because the enemy can't dwell in light. Darkness will never overtake the light. Light will always overtake darkness, and light will destroy the negatives in you and I in our lives that we try to develop. Now, the lights are on in here. Say it was pitch dark outside, and the lights are on, and somebody said, I'd say, Jacob, would you go turn the dark switch on? Go turn the dark switch on. You can't turn the dark switch on because you have to turn the light switch off because darkness will never overtake light. Well, I could go on for a half hour on that because I've dwelled on that. But see, that's what we need to do with the things that we got going, the issues we got going on in our life. And like I say, because I, sometimes I get to speak and people think, oh, well, you're just that old drunk, you know, you, 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 I don't have that problem. But there are so many issues in our life. Fear is a big one in the church. Hope is a big one in the church. Um, backbiting a little bit in the church, you know, gossip and, and judgment and criticism and unforgiveness and bitterness. There's so many other things. And as long as we keep them in the dark room, we're just going to keep developing that. We'll just keep developing it. And let the Lord show you what if there's something in there. To, and it has to be up to us. God, help me. Would you put some light on this? I'm so tired of living this way. I want more joy in my life. I want more out of my life than to live it in this dark room. Would you come make, make yourself to home, Lord? Not not just in the salvation room now. I'm opening my house to you. It's us that have to open the house. He is not going to barge in and take over. He never has. He gave Adam and Eve a choice in the garden, didn't he? He didn't say, well, here's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Here's a tree of life. Don't you touch that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He didn't say anything. He gave them a choice, just like we do. Choose life or choose death. He gives us the same choice. And I'll tell you, I still have a dark room, but I don't go there near as often. When when things start coming on, I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What am I developing here? Lord, help me get get the light on this because I don't want to develop it any farther than it needs to be developed. But we're in denial if we say, well, I don't have a dark room. Yes, we do. (laughs) We all do in one area or another. Amen? Okay. I don't know what time it is. No, we don't do that. Okay. <laughs> so there's all these things of, of letting God in our dark room. And I, so I want to give you just a brief... So maybe you'll kind of know where I come from. I'm, I want you to know I'm talking about Jesus and his lips and he's in the house. And until he come into my house, I was a wreck. Until this word got into me, 
and I got into this word, my life. Now, this Bible's not, I've wore out three Bibles. This isn't getting there. Um, I, like to sh I like to show people these old Bibles I have because I said when I bought that Bible, it was brand spanking new. Not a, not a wrinkle in it. And I was, a, I was a total mess. I was a total mess. I was wrinkled and battered and torn. And the older this Bible come, the more torn this Bible come, the more clean I become. I mean, that's, it's just how much you use your Bible. But I, I mean, I'll just give you a brief story. When I'll just, I'll just zoom all the way up till the time in my life, 25 years ago, I was ready to put a 357 to my head. I was sober 13 years. I thought, if this is sobriety, I'm checking out. I'm done. And I went to a man's house and told him that I was, I'm, I'm done. I, 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 I kind of told him what I was going to do, I think, because I was really wanting help. And this man, by the way, had told me a year and a half earlier, he had a cocaine addiction. And he'd come up to me, I mean, he was snotting, running out of his, his nose and his eyes. He was a mess. He was a head filer and I was a head sawyer. And uh, finally he was gone for a month. And I didn't know what he saw him. So he came back. Well, he'd went to a Christian recovery center and come back to the work. And that Monday he came back. I come to work. And man, he come up to me. His eyes were this big. Nick, I found Jesus. <laughs> And at the time, I was going to AA, and I had a higher power. I didn't, you know, I didn't go to Jesus right yet. Jesus hadn't come into my heart. And uh, I said, good, Phil. <laughs> you needed Jesus. You were a mess. So it was a year and a half later that I went, hit my bottom sober, and was ready to end my life. I really was. And I went up to his house. He said, Nick, you need Jesus. And so I thought, well, 357 Jesus. Maybe I'll try this Jesus stuff. So I got a Bible, and as God would have it, God is, he is always on time. His timing is so perfect. As God would have it, that following Wednesday, they started the beginner's Bible study at this man's house. So I thought, well, I'm here at church. I better, better go start going to that Bible study. I got me a Bible with all the tabs on it because I had no idea what, where any of the books were in the Bible. Um, so I bought a Bible, and that was in, it was in September of 92. I bought a Bible, and I started reading it, and I started going to this Bible study, and something happened. When I started reading this word, something happened to me. It really did. I, I, for, let's see, September, October, November, December, January, about like six months, six and a half months, I couldn't put this word down. I couldn't put it down. I literally, I used to watch a lot of TV. I watched one show, just one show for that six months, and that was Tool Time Tim, Home Improvement. I love Tool Time Tim. <laughs> I would watch that show. The rest of the time, I was in the Word of God. Hours at night, at work, on my Ellis break, I was, I was in the Bible. I just couldn't put it down. It, was just, it just hooked me. I hear why you understand. I was hooked. I was hooked. I was, I was kind of like that, you know, I, Jesus had let out a lot, because Jesus is a fisherman, right? He let out a lot of line way, way deep into the waters to hook me, because I was like a sucker. <laughs> That's what I was. I was feeding off the bottom. I was a bottom feeder <laughs> off the filth of the world. But he did get down there with this line, and he hooked me with this word. And I started reading, and I started reading, and I started reading, and I read about, gosh, he brought these Israelites out of Egypt, all the things that, that, that God did to the Pharaoh. Like, wow. How, how, and and well, wait a minute now. These million, they walked across, they walked across the, the Red Sea parted, and they walked on, through on dry ground. See, now here it is. It's here. It's here. For these months, it was all here. I just couldn't quite, I was hooked, but I couldn't swallow it. You know, because that's, how could that happen? That these seas could open up and they could walk through on dry ground. It didn't say they slopped through in mud. They walked through on dry ground. Same when the, when they, when the Jordan opened up. And then I, then I started reading about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What? These guys were in a fiery furnace, heated up seven times. It come out not even smelling like smoke. Hooked. <laughs> I was hooked. But I couldn't swallow it. I just couldn't. And I read all this, the stories to the Old Testament. Well, in the New Testament, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Well, let me see. Hmm. God came down in the flesh. Let's see, he was impregnated, a teenage virgin who gave birth to God. <laughs> what? I was hooked. <laughs> but I couldn't swallow that because I had it here. I just could not swallow it. Then all the things Jesus did, walking on water, healing everybody he healed, raising the dead, all the things he was doing. I was reading it for months and months and months. I couldn't put it down. And I was getting hooked. I was really hooked. And I couldn't. And I, I, admit, I would be honest, I probably tried to throw the hook a few times because I just, I just couldn't buy all this stuff. But I was desperate. 
I was desperate, lost, hopeless, naked, wretched, and blind, just like it talks about the people the churches have forgot about. Where they were. I was that way and I knew it, so I just kept going. I kept persevering. One night at the Bible study, Don Harden was, he closed the Bible study. Usually he just closed it with a quick prayer and they were done. But he said that night, I talked to him later, he could see a strain on my face because we were talking about the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I, I, was, I was just, I wanted so desperately to believe all this. I did. But I just couldn't get it out of here. That night he started praying when he got done, but he started praying in the Spirit. And he started singing in the Spirit. Two guys, Dave, Stephen Borgelt and David Thompson, Stephen and David, biblical names, laid hands on me, and I started praying in the Spirit. I had no idea what I was saying. And this isn't a message on tongues or anything like that, but this is what changed my life. I started praying in the Spirit, and in a nanosecond, everything that was here went, whoo, was right there. In a nanosecond, it was all true. See, that's when Jesus came in the house. That's when he came in with the power. That's when he came in with the truth. That's when he came in with the love. That's when he came in with the hope. Everything come rushing from here. See, so many Christians have all this head knowledge, but it hasn't come down and been transformed into heart knowledge, into spiritual knowledge, because he said, these words I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. And when that happened that night, it changed my life forever. And I'll tell you, it wasn't hooked anymore. I swallowed it. Hook, line, and sinker. I swallowed it, man. Yeah, I could just hear, we got him on now. Really, man. And he, <laughs> he'd been working in me ever since. And I finally swallowed it all. And see, it was the power of the Holy Spirit that did that. And I don't know, I know there's different religions that, that, that scare people. They, Paul rebuked them in Corinthians when they get caught up in all these stupid stuff. The Holy Spirit isn't the author of confusion. He's a gentleman. And when, but, so, so there's a lot of hype that causes the Holy Spirit to get a bad name, but then there's a lot of people who just won't allow him to really do something in their life. But see, I call that moment that night for me there again. I go back. It was a candid camera moment when you least expect it. Boom! Everything become true. Everything become real. This Bible is life to me now. His, he's life. And <laughs> I'm so serious. When I text my wife this morning, I live to preach Jesus. Now, I'm right now to help support the Roxy. I'm, I took on a janitor job. Paul was a tent maker. I'm washing toilets and mopping floors to help support the Roxy Theater. I mean, I'm doing that, but I, but I, I do it all. You know what I sing? In the morning. When I rise, when I'm washing toilets, every it's my song for washing toilets. In the morning, when I rise, just give me Jesus. <laughs> I do. I'm just serious. I I live for that. But you have to do other things on the side too. But I live to preach Jesus because He changed my life. He He He, he can change anyone's life. Well, changed Apostle Paul's life. Look what He did to Paul, and He can do that in your life. I don't know anybody in here. Well, I know Jacob. I don't know, but he can do that. He wants to, if you let him into your house, he wants to give you so much more. And this ain't hype and religion. This ain't a big emotional thing. It's true. If you just speak to him, talk to him. And somebody gets caught up, well, I don't know how to pray. Just talk to him. Just talk to him. Oh, Father, God, would you just come and minister to me? Let me just put my head on your shoulder, on your lap, on your heart. I want to hear your heartbeat. Lord, would you, you can come in now. Just, I want you in my dark room because I'm tired. I'm tired of this unforgiveness. I'm tired of this fear. Can you come in and put your light on it? I'm just, would you destroy this negative? I'm sick and tired of developing it. And you know, that's kind of what it takes, isn't it? We just kind of have to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. We do. I could go on, but I'm going to quit. <laughs> let's, let's pray. Oh, I don't want to quit this because I don't know everybody here. I can, know, I can assume, but that assuming is a bad thing, that everybody knows Jesus. I don't know that there's someone here that's never asked Jesus to come into the house, <laughs> ever said, Lord, it's so simple. It's too simple. I'm a sinner. I realize I've messed up. Would you forgive me? Would you come and live in me, take up residence. Would you be my Savior and my Lord? Not just, the, not just the salvation room, but did you come into my house and take charge? I need you. Is there anybody here that's never made that confession? 
You know, I've been to a lot of different churches, and I, and I heard a lot of different ways that pastors do this, and it's, it's all personal, personal preference. But I, by myself, don't go for that. Close your eyes and bow your head, and everybody, you raise your hand. I don't go for that. I mean, that's just me. I mean, Jesus said, if you, were, if you, uh, would, you, if you would, um, uh, what is that scripture? If you would confess me before man, I will confess you before the Father. There's something about standing up and confessing in front of men with everybody's eyes closed. That's just how I am. And, um, so is there anybody that really has never done that? That's, we're good to go. <laughs> and when I say that, I mean, we're good to go. Boy, I could go off on that too with eternal life. And we're good to go, man. We, we got a reservation already made. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time, Father. I thank you for, for the life that you've put in us. Lord, Holy Spirit, would you just minister to us today? God, would you just take this message? And God, would you take it into hearts this morning in this room? God, that there would be people in this room, because I know that we're all human that there's somebody struggling with some issue, Lord. There's a, there's a negative right now being developed in a dark room. And Lord, you, just, you, won't, you won't burst into that room. You're a gentleman. But Lord, if we would just simply say, Lord, would you, would, you, would you put your light on this fear? Would you put your light on this hopelessness, on this anger, on this bitterness, on this unforgiveness, on these pills I'm not supposed to be taking, on these books I'm not supposed to be looking at? Whatever it is, Lord, God, that we would give you rule and reign of our house, that you would go into every room, make yourself to home. Lord, we praise you, we thank you, that when we show up into this building, into this nice little church, that you're in the house. I just pray that people can leave today, no matter where they go, they can look at their neighbor and they can look at their friend. Did you know Jesus is in the house? that you live and dwell in us. You go where we go. We live and we move and we have our being in Christ Jesus. We thank you and we praise you for liberty. We thank you for the love that you put, the comfort, the joy. Lord God, the freedom, the liberty, the relationship, all these things that happen to us just by letting you in our house. <laughs> we didn't do anything to deserve it. We just say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Change us, move us, mold us into your image. In Jesus' name, amen.